Hello, welcome everybody uh, to the Sleep In 2023 a grand finale event. Um, I'm here with uh, Dr. Robert Turner. Hi, Dr. Turner. Hello, good to be here. <laughs> Um, we're really excited today to talk a little bit about Robert's work, his background. Um, I feel so lucky to, I guess it's been over a year now that, um, I th yeah, definitely over a year and a half, maybe yeah. two years that we've been yeah, in contact. Yeah, maybe. Uh-huh. Right. Uh, so as people are joining us, I uh, was hoping that you could share a little bit of your background in general and, um, you know, eventually that you're getting into some sleep research here, but you got a lot going on <laughs> before you ever even got to sleep. So could you share a little bit about that? I can. And, and thank you so very much for having me. And I do think it's about two years, Dr. Michael Grandner and, uh, introduced us. And um, it wasn't quite obvious to me when he first introduced us. Um, where the where the kind of the mesh points are where we had like overlapping a lot of we're doing but over the two years has become very obvious that we have lots of uh, overlap and supporting each other in a lot of different ways so I'm very appreciative of that and uh, just to give a, a brief background you're you're right I have a pretty varied background this is my third career I guess you could say maybe even fourth but uh, you know after college I played professional football uh, both in in the um, in the old USFL, which they're bringing back right now. Um, but I played way back with Herschel Walker and Doug Flutie. And that was on the New Jersey Generals. I was actually, my claim, I guess you could say, is with uh, with a real tie to sleep. It was Reggie White, who was drafted by the Memphis Showboats. And I was in the same class as Reggie. And the reason I mention that is because, you know, he, he did die of complications related to uh, sleep apnea. So he's someone that the NFL folks really understand and know. And after um, the Memphis Showboats, I was, I was traded to the New Jersey Generals and I played a season there. And then I went up to Canada and played two seasons there. And then at the very end of my career, I was with the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, as we always say, I, I had a cup of coffee with them. And my claim there is that I backed up Ronnie Lott for a little while. So that was great. What um, position did you play? I was a defensive back and, and a uh, strong safety. So I was played uh, strong and uh, strong safety. So I'm a little bigger and a little faster. And uh, I love to hit. And so that was what I really enjoyed. In college, I was actually a wide receiver and I moved to defensive back. Um, and I was really good, I would say, at, at both of them. And in fact, receiver was probably my more natural position, but I just like to hit. And, and as we say in the NFL, I, I like to, I would rather be a hammer than a nail. So <laughs> I was, <laughs> I like to hit people. Um, and then after that, I was really, I call it kind of my wilderness years. I lived in Los Angeles and and uh, then moved to New York and lived in Dallas and just trying to find myself, which I eventually really became my book, which is was I went to graduate school and pursued a PhD in medical sociology and my dissertation turned into a book uh, called um, NFL Means Not for Long, The Life and the Career of the NFL Athlete. And um, so that second career or third career was working in business and trying to trying to do a whole bunch of different things. And I went back to graduate school. And then on the other side of that, that um, really started being interested in understanding uh, everything around brain health, cognition, um, CTE, you know, those kinds of things. And, and oddly enough, I didn't know that I would be, you know, moving into the sleep space. But when I was doing a, um, it was a program, a summer program in um, New York City, we mentioned uh, Dr. Michael Grandner, and I wanted to understand kind of the bio, psycho, social, behavioral aspects of later life cognition as, as people are older adults. And the ties with that in CTE concussions. And one of the doctors told me, he said, you need to talk to Michael Grandner because there's a big you know, relationship, a big link between sleep, sleep apnea, sleep behavior, sleep, you know, everything from your sleep hygiene and, uh, uh, you know, with neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and that kind of stuff. And so that pushed me into this space. And that led me through Michael getting to know you. And, you know, that's an abbreviated version of how we are yeah. here today. Well, um, when you talk about making this jump to uh, kind of like academia, I, I, do you feel like some of the skills you had as a professional athlete um, are good for academia or is it different sides of your personality or I'm just kind of curious. I think all of the above, but I, I think one of the things that I, and I do, as you know, now I really look at health and I, I look at, you know, um, understanding health outcomes. And I, and I, I go around, I speak around, uh, around the country a lot and, and I'm mm -hmm. very much trying to encourage um 
former athletes or athletes as they're transitioning and they're thinking about schooling and all this other thing. I, I really am trying to get them to think about careers in um, medical and science and health because I, I, you know, I come from the perspective I, and I look at, you know, football, the football university universe or um, the football community as an overall community and who better knows about health of that community than people who are from inside that community. And I think that we're well positioned to ask lots of different questions that people who are well-trained in health and medicine, but maybe not know about the mentality, um, about the lifestyle, about the behavior, about everything around sports. And so I hope that, you know, through what the work I do, we can get lots of young ladies involved with this um, because, you know, looking at soccer and all of these other different things is we know that Title IX has created lots of opportunities in sports. I hope that they can bring their opportunities into sports the way that I am. And I'm trying to let lots of young men who play in different sports in that arena to be as well. So in a way, the answer to your question is I was so unprepared because I didn't really know anything about it. But in another way, one thing that really helps me and I think it will help lots of athletes is that we are very self-motivated. We're very, very disciplined, right? You, we, we're, you know, you, when you're in science, as you know, you're starting to break into some of the work we're doing. You have to be very patient. There's lots of um, rejections, you know, you, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that you learn in, in being on a team or even in individual sports that you always know how to compete and you always push forward to, to win. Um, that's what you need if you're going to be a scientist or, and, or in academia. And so those are very helpful skills in what I do. Um, well, for people listening, they might even notice some synergy between uh, what Dr. Turner is talking about, um, about having athletes themselves that are part of uh, the research uh, and how Project Sleep is really focused on making sure that patients are part of uh, the conversation with uh, scientists and doctors. Uh, and so you just have a, a huge respect for uh, people, um, you know, that are part of certain communities uh, and the importance of that uh, synergy with the researchers and everything. I just love that so much. Um, yeah. yeah. Yep. I would say we just, you know, again, as the final plug is even, you know, we just talked about Josh Andrews, right? He plays NFL and he has narcolepsy, you know, and he started, he was at our first conference, which we'll go over and probably I'm sure we'll touch on some of that, but people stay today, you know, Hey, that was over a year and a half ago and say how impressed they were and how impactful his talk was because here you have this big 300 pound guy talking about, you know, his health vulnerabilities and what he has to do to make sure that he has positive brain health and take care of his sleep. And there's like, like if he's willing to go out in front of a national audience and talk about that, then it opens the door for lots of other people. So I feel like, you know, again, um, being an athlete and being from different communities, no matter what communities you are, we all have something to add, to offer. And I really encourage that we can get as many diverse voices involved with this as possible because it will help our understanding and our growth. And our learning. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to share a little bit about the first kind of sleep project that you did? Sure, sure. So um, fortunate enough, I, 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 you know, I have a, um, I guess we should start by saying that I am an assistant professor at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And um, my, my appointment is in clinical research and leadership with a secondary appointment in neurology. And through that, a very good friend, uh, Dr. Scott Brooks, who's the director of the Global Sport Institute, um, asked me to come on in as a faculty fellow um, at Arizona State University to, he said, hey, listen, we, you know, we want to develop uh, our institute and, and, and um, research is a really important part of what we do. We'd love to give you some money to start a seed project in anything you want to. Um, and, you know, we'll make our resources available, but we'd love to learn how to do this kind of biomedical research. And so I said, hey, let's do a, let's do a research project because on all of the stuff that I had been reading, um, especially again, looking at cognitive outcomes of older adults, was that football players and Black men in particular have, um, you know, high um, morbidity rates when it comes to issues around sleep and, and, you know, sleep apnea and all of these other, you know, sleep um, 
disorders. And I said, why don't we put together a couple of um, focus groups with former collegiate football players and former NFL athletes, and then a general group of Black men from the community to try to understand kind of what their health literacy is around sleep apnea. And from that, let's make, um, let's figure out the messaging that's important and see if we can make some public service announcements that can reach people to encourage them to uh, learn more about sleep apnea and get tested and, um, and address the seriousness of this issue. And so the outcomes were way better than we, we could have ever expected. We had, we did three focus groups. I think it was six to eight men. Um, it was about almost two years ago. We did it over um, right, right as COVID was kicking in, we were able to do this, but um, we made some phenomenal um, you know, PSAs. And now what our next, we're writing a couple of manuscripts for peer review publication in, um, you know, journals for academia, but really more so what we want to do now is we want to take those three or four different public service announcements to the different groups that we, we um, focused on and, and send them out to the public and see what the public's reactions are and see um, what we need to do, how, how effective they are and do they in fact to get people to, um, you know, seek more information and increase their literacy around sleep apnea. And hopefully our goal is to develop effective messaging and learn where to deliver that. So that way we can um, make an impact on the broader community of individuals that are at the highest risk for sleep apnea. Um, I think that's so fantastic. I, I think that you've talked to me about some of the key findings from that research that um, do you, I don't, I know it's not probably not published yet, but is there any kind of like findings that were surprising to you in doing the focus groups or? Yeah, well, I will say, for instance, one of the one of the findings that was really surprising, um, but makes complete sense when again, right? You think about it, you think that you know, even being from the population, but I, you know, this is where we talk about before we do community based participatory research. We feel like you know, you need to strip all that you think you know, and the best way to under have learning and understanding is hear from people in that community. And so we thought, okay, well. Um, given, you know, with former football players, you got Reggie White and who's it's really made an impact people, everyone within the NFL at least knows that story. And so we we thought, all right, well, who do we turn to in football that would be important to be involved with our public service announcements? And so we asked these guys and, and I thought they would say, well, you know, we want to hear from someone, you know, like a Hall of Famer or someone, you know, with a big name who reaches across and and has a lot of respect within football. And, and the guy said to us, no, that's not who we want to hear from. We want to hear from just an everyday average football player who maybe have, was a journeyman or that was down in the trenches that maybe could have played a year, or could have played eight years, right? But not one with a lot of fanfare and everything. Because what for them, the, the Hall of Famer guys are the ones that are always getting paid to be like shields, shells, right? Mm -hmm. Going out there and spreading the, the, the message and making lots of money for that. And they go, so we would, we would wonder whether that message that was delivered was genuine from that player. We want to know someone who really understands or has been impacted by the disease. That was really important for us to understand and hear. Um, and so and that's where we're really trying to figure out, again, uh, using what we've learned in those tools and that, and how do you craft a message? So the messenger is equally important as the message. But then now we're really thinking about what are the delivery mechanisms, right? Do you, you know, do you send it through an email, through a list? And is it from the Alumni Association? Do you go to barbershops? Do you go to conferences where we know men are? Do you send the messaging to their wives? All of these things that, you know, we're learning really has an impact with across all of these different groups that we mentioned, you know, the general men and the general black men, the general public, the former college football players and the former NFL football players. We're understanding that the message is important. The um, messenger, the delivery mechanism is important. All of those things we're really now di diving a little bit deeper in to try to capture that. So that way we can, again, we feel like um, health literacy is a real key component to addressing health inequalities. Hmm. I love that. I think the focus on the messenger is so important. Um, you know, Project Sleep tries to focus on having like all of our 
uh, social media and everything actually feature real people. Um, I think there's like a lot of organizations that use stock photography where you kind of feel like those, we know they're not real, you know, um, <laughs> and having real faces and real people, like you said, people that were impacted. Um, I think that's such a great message. Um, you did mention wives. And I think there was one takeaway that you uh, told me about, about, um, men's uh feelings around family and how that might impact them to go to the doctor more oh yeah we did we talked a, a little bit about that one we know that for you know for guys you know kind of their purpose um two things one their children especially their daughters are really important why do you want to live why do you need to take care of your health and because you know for them reaching back and thinking that they can be healthy and take care of this for their their children that's really really important the other thing that we have heard from lots of men and you know this bears out with uh previous studies and we're trying to under examine this a little bit more but we know that there's research that says essentially men who are married men um, live healthier lives, right? And one of the reasons, and we talk to football players, I give you an example, one of the stories that one of the guys talked about when I was um, giving a talk up in, in Wayne State, the former De Detroit Lion. And he talks about how about five years after he had been out of the NFL, he realized that he hadn't been to the dentist for about five years. And he said, he turned and he looked at his wife and he said, baby, how come I haven't been to the dentist? And she said, you're a grown man. You need to order, uh, you know, an appointment and go to your dentist on your own. And that was it was a revelation on him because when he was young, when he was living at home as a kid, his mother took care of his health. Then he went and played college football and played in the NFL. There was other people that were really important to play for his health. So he just in his own mind figured that his wife, that was her responsibility because that's who had been, you know, the caretaker of his health all his life is the women in his life. And um, that was, you know, a really real awakening for him that, wait a minute, I need to be an active participant in my life. And so we do know that women play a very important role in men's health, right? And so we want to understand the messaging. Certain messaging is goes to men. Certain messaging goes to those women. Certain messaging we've also heard is that, you know, one of the guys told us out of our, our um, focus groups, he said, one of the biggest things that I think I've learned out about this is how important as um, is your sleep. And he goes, and so for me, I'm, he goes, now I can actually, instead of walking to people and say, hey, how are you doing? He goes, as a start of conversation, I can just ask him, one of my male friends is, how'd you sleep last night? Right? He goes, I feel like I'm empowered because this focus group gave me some information that I can talk to people about as to why it's important to make sure you have proper sleep health. Mm, I love that. Um, last night, um, we had an advocacy broadcast and Stacey was talking about the power of telling your story and how you don't really know. I mean, you could just be in a grocery line one day and say something um, to someone next door and say, oh, I have you know sleep apnea and how that could stick with that person and be meaningful down the road. Uh, and you don't always know which moments are going to be the ones that make a life-changing impact in someone's life. Um, oh, no question. No question. I, since I've started to do this work, it has amazed me how often I have run into particularly black men, because that's my focus, right, that have sleep apnea or say, you know what? I'm, I actually am concerned that I might have sleep apnea. I need to go do something about it. So once I started studying it, once we started sharing messages like this, it is that secret that, again, guys right next door to you, guys that you grew up with may be dealing with some of this, may be struggling with some of this, but never felt quite empowered. They may have felt a little bit more embarrassed or something to be able to... Uh, to talk about it. And we know that from other literature that's really important is many people, you find out that you have a sleep apnea or some other sleep behavioral problems because of the person you're sleeping next to. You know, if the if your partner, your wife said or whomever says, hey, did you know this? Right. That and they can they can really encourage them to go get um, some treatment or help or get some more understanding about this. So I think in part what we've learned and what we understand is if if not only just you know a significant other that you may be in a romantic relationship with but it's 
all the people in your, your network. It's your whole network that will help you remain healthy or find health. Um, so the thing, the very thing that you may be holding on to and afraid to talk about may be the very thing that puts you at the greatest jeopardy. And, and you'll, what we are learning all, all over the place is that even just taking that one little step and saying, hey, man, I think I might have a little problem or do, do you know much about sleep apnea? Put it that way, right? What do you know? Or do you know anybody who has that? What did you recommend? And then boom, before you know it, you are in a network of people who can give you some information. Oh, I think that's so important. Um, I, often when I hear like people centered care or person or patient centered care, I often think it's kind of missing the boat. Um, be our personalized medicine. Those things are important too. However, we all live in communities. We live in social structures and um, those can be for better or worse, you know, um, uh, to help people get through things. So, yeah. Um, you know, I just realized I've never asked you, how's your sleep, Dr. Turner? Ah, uh, it's something that I, you know what, it's, it's, it's an evolving thing because my lifestyle has changed. Um, you know, I used to live alone and single, no kids and all this other stuff. And then um, my dad has dementia and unfortunately my mom passed away last summer. And so I moved back to New Jersey to take care of my dad. Right. And so that means that, you know, all of a sudden his health is a, a, a primacy to me. So I have to, you know, juggle looking after him, taking him to his doctor's appointments and all these other things. We have a full-time home health aide with uh, here to home help there. Um, so I look, I have to look after his ha um, health. I have to look after a, a big, great big house that I grew up in, you know, and all the things that are around there, his adult daycare and everything. Then, of course, I have a very demanding job for myself. And then beyond that, I have to look after my own health and then maybe try to have a social life on top of that and going back and forth between New Jersey and D.C., which is where my work is. So all of that changed. And I realized that all of a sudden, you know, I need to have a, develop different habits, right? I need to have I need to have a little bit more structure in my life now than I had before. So I, I, I've I've said, okay, you know what? Now you need to go to bed early, a little bit earlier, because you know every day may be a little bit different with my dad and his life, right? So I need to make sure that I'm well rested for that. I I got I got to make sure that I'm very on top of my schedule. So you know, and then I'm also changing my eating habits and all of those different things. And, and it, it's never more important now than I realize where people would say, take care of yourself, make sure that you um, take care of your own health. So that is really where I'm spending a lot of time recognizing that there are different habits that I have to change. And, I, and sleep is one of those really important ones because I can't function the way that I need to unless I get my sleep. So it's a struggle, but it is something that I recognize and it is definitely something that I have um, started to make some you know, changes around to make sure that I'm the best Robert can be to take care of uh, Robert Sr. here in the house. It is. That's right. You're the second. So it's Robert that's Sr. Right. Uh -huh. Exactly. That's right. Um, well, thank you for all you're doing for your dad, too. I know that's uh, a lot. <laughs> that's a lot, a lot. Um, guys, if you have any questions for Dr. Turner, um, please send them over. People are just, you know, uh, commenting that they're excited about the conversation. But if you guys have any specific questions, send them over. Um, and yeah, I'd love to an answer anything I possibly can. Um, so, and, and I, I take you a fun story as we're waiting for some people to, uh, to uh, maybe ask a question, but I, once when I was playing professional football, I was in Canada and, um, and I was in a group of high school kids and I was like, Hey, you can ask me anything you want. Da, da, da. And one of the kids raised his hand and said, who cut your hair? He goes, that's a funny hair that you got. I was like, well, I did tell him that, that this is before I was bald, right? But I was like, I did tell him I'd answer any question. So I recognize that you can open yourself to almost anything if you say, hey, I'm an open book and I'm willing to answer any questions. But I am actually, because I'm very passionate about this topic and about um, people's health and doing whatever we can, particularly from the social and behavioral aspects of, uh, of health. Yeah. Uh, well, someone just said kids are the best. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I was going to ask you a little bit about the project that, you know, we've kind of taken on now and, um, and 
uh, it's a, another wonderful collaboration with Dr. Um, Michael Granier. And, uh, and so we got a small grant uh, a few years ago, it feels like, um, to do this project as sort of like an extension from your first project is how I see it, um, where you were a little bit more focused on sleep apnea uh, and now looking more broadly at um, sleep disorders. But I don't know if you wanna share a little bit about maybe what makes you excited about this project? Yeah, I, I'm excited about a lot of areas of this project, but I also want to talk about maybe one of the areas that I'm, I, I'm that makes me nervous about this project. Mm -hmm. sure. um, I'm learning again, right? I, but believe it or not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm the um, principal investigator for four grants right now. I've been very successful in writing grants and running projects, I have a research pro, um, lab that's gotten off the ground. And I also run, you know, part of the Black Men's Brain um, Brain Health Conference. So got lots of stuff going on. The thing that I'm, I'm most probably a little nervous about with this project is that what I've learned so far that there is so much work to be done in this sleep area. And we will learn so much from these focus groups where we're going to do six focus groups or something like that. We need, and I, I like it, this is such an emerging area that, and, and an untapped area, particularly looking at the black population, the way we are, we're going to need more researchers. We're going to, we're going to, there's going to be a demand like harmony, um, you know, bioscience, was it, um, mm -hmm. was it harmony bio, bioscience has, um, they're so ex excited to get behind this project that you know, there's going to be other opportunities to expand it and to do more work from here. So we're going to need lots of other scholars and other young students who want to, you know, help us, you know, kind of uh, figure out, crack the code in this area. That I I'm concerned that there's so much we'll learn so much, and there'll be so much more to do, and we got so little bandwidth to do yeah. it. So that's one of my my concerns about it. But I will say that, like, again, we're, we're looking at, and you'll probably know this better than I do, you can talk to it, but we're looking at six segments of the population that ha are involved, um, you know, with a, a very uh, diverse, you know, cross-section of, of Black population, not, you know, not just men, women, or anything, but lots of different areas of, of people who are professionals that provide care, uh, family members, people who have issues with, you know, sleep um, problems. We're going to collect a lot of data, and all of this is just to help us better understand how people see and understand what their behaviors are around um, this, what their health literacy is, all of those areas, which will then help us formulate other questions, surveys, um, much more deeply involved within the population as to how do we understand the breadth of the issues and then at some point working with, you know, clinicians, working with advocacy, working with community, um, working with researchers where we can come and find some kinds of interventions that we can test to see if they are going to help improve um, the health, you know, the sleep health of individuals in those many different uh, populations. Yeah, I think that that nervous, uh, <laughs> what makes you nervous about it too is how I feel kind of everything with sleep and project sleep is that there's just so much more to be done. Uh, and so it, it does sort of uh, feel a little bit overwhelming. And, uh, but I guess it's also the exciting part of it is that it's a frontier, you know, um, and that to be at that frontier is pretty cool. I was just going to pull up quickly so people could see the uh, announcement about uh, the research project is on our website. Uh, and we're currently recruiting participants. Uh, so we have, as Robert said, six different groups um, that we're looking for for these different focus groups. Uh, one, Black Americans diagnosed with sleep disorders. Then one for family members of Black Americans diagnosed with sleep disorders. Then Black Americans with no issues with sleep. Uh, Black Americans with sleep issues without a formal diagnosis leaders of Black American community and faith-based organizations and healthcare providers at local community clinics. So, uh, and we're still recruiting people for that. Uh, and they are 90 minutes uh, each is, um, I believe, what we <laughs> are going to do. Um, and so if you do want to get involved and you haven't uh, signed up yet, there's a link to register. Uh, and we have some different flyers here with more information. So, um, and here's the dates of those different groups. Uh, we're going to start with the uh, people diagnosed with sleep disorders, and then uh, over the next 
you know, six weeks, we will get through to asking healthcare providers um, their input. So yeah, I mean, there's just going to be so much research. And I love what you said about we need more people to get involved in it um, on the research side, uh, which sure. I, I, yeah. It's... Let me just jump in. One of the things that I think it will, hopefully your, your audience will find interesting or imp vitally important is believe it or not, from the work that we've done, looked in the literature, the people that are in my lab and, and at Project Sleep, you know, kind of working collaboratively to, to figure out, to, you know, what needs to be done. This is the first project of its kind ever to be done, ever directed at um, Black population in America, right, is to, to go directly to the folks and ask them, collecting information from them. It's kind of mind-blowing because sleep, everybody sleeps, everybody sleeps, right, or everyone needs to sleep. Um, and it's such, it, sleep impacts so many different areas of your life, and it, all of your health is tied to sleep. So the question is, why has there never been a, even a small pilot study like this? Why has one never been done? We're, you know, we're trying to get anywhere from, what, 36 to 48 people all together. Why have we, nothing like this has ever been done? That just shows you how much work needs to be done and why it's so vitally important for people to participate as being participants in research projects like this. But then also those people who are out there and thinking about where to direct their careers as clinicians, as researchers, academics, as everything else. We vitally need people from all backgrounds to get involved with this kind of research. And it's not just limited to the Black community. We just are starting there. And we will do this in many other communities by bringing experts in. But we vitally need so many different people involved to help us uncover things that we don't know around sleep so we can help improve the lives of, of individuals. Yeah. I mean, that's often what I think is that you could have the best treatments in the world <laughs> for something, but if people don't know that these conditions exist, that, that they don't know that treatments exist, that if they could get diagnosed and then um, get support and get treatment and that there is some hope for improvement, then what's the best treatment and, you know, worth? It's just not going to, if it can't reach people. Exactly. And we have to come from the other, other you know, side, too, is that what happens when there are people, and we've, we've learned this around why the social and behavioral determinants of health are so important, because it used to be the doctors would say, okay, we understand what your problem is, here's a prescription, and go do this, right? And then you come back six weeks later, and the doctor is like, why didn't you do this? Because the doctor feels like, hey, I gave you the pill, I gave you with this, but we've got to understand what are the barriers, what are keeping people from, you know, with the best intentions, of maybe sometimes going to the doctor, hearing what to do, and then not be able to do it. What are the barriers that keep people from going to the doctors? Everybody talks about Tuskegee, right? But there may be other, many other barriers that are very cultural, gender-based, all kinds of things. We need to hear from those. We need to be able to help people get in a position where they can get the information that they need and then um, try to understand what are the things that are the barriers in their front in their ways from being able to live out what it is that is will help improve their health right so it takes so many different dimensions to get involved with this and that's what we're really trying to do as the startup with this project but then really my lab is really focused on that in so many different ways is how do we figure out what it is we don't know how do we get the information how do we make sense of the information translational health wise and then how do we get the experts who are clinicians that are working with people to work with people in the community from many different um perspectives to help the community uh, raise their overall health profile. Yeah. Well, what makes me so encouraged about working with you is that um, I do feel like I hear from a lot of people's different perspectives, but if it's then just me sharing that or something, like doing this project makes it so much more real, I think, by um, being able to formalize it into um, the language of science, I guess I'd say. Um, data, data, data. It's data, data-driven research, right? That, that's what people want, right? At the end of the day, right? How do we know what we know, right? So you're right. You're absolutely right. How do we coalesce it all together and be able to say, this is what we've learned? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and that's why I'm so grateful to have you working with you because that language is still very um, foreign to me, uh, even, you know, trying my best or it's just not, it's not exactly what keeps my brain awake. Uh, the language of science. Um, I like storytelling and obviously like creative writing. And um, so we do have a few questions here. Okay. Um, 
And people just, you know, commenting back, uh, Debbie said how important it is to think about sleep in caretakers uh, and living with parents with dementia. Um, I imagine there's a lot to learn there. There's a lot um, to learn there. Yeah. Anne says, thank you so much for all you're doing. Stacy says, yes, this is huge with CPAP. I think about, um, you know, that you can be prescribed the CPAP. Uh, so many barriers uh, providers don't consider. Um, and so let's see, we had a question here. Um, any new technologies that you're excited about in terms of research or reaching people um, or in football? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's not really the the area that I I focus on. Again, I do more social and behavioral. I'm I really focus on kind of understanding what people's attitudes and beliefs are and how they impact your behavior, right? So technology is is vitally important to me in, in in a lot of different ways. But even for me, is if you have technology, what what enables people to actually utilize the technology or prevents people from you using the technology? Those are the things that I that really keep me up at night, so to speak, to think about, right? But there is one. Um, I'm working with a group. Um, it's Dr. Rhoda Al, who's in Boston at Boston University. And then I have another um, good friend, Ganesh Bhubal, who, who together we're thinking about, all of us are thinking about ways that um, your smartphone, which we all engage with a, a great deal, how can that um, provide early detection of Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative diseases um because we 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 text we talk we re we search we do search right so you know this is big data this our, our lives so much of what our lives are interacting with that computer what if there's a way that we can take that data for each individual as well as collective populations and it helps us start to see people's some of their you know their typing patterns or speaking patterns and other ways that might be showing they're slowing down but we think about even with you know how do you use your device um when when you're tired compared to how do you use your device when you're more fully awake and active right which is kind of be a, a passive piece of technology but could be very active in helping us understand when we are most vulnerable Right. So that's one of the things we, we really think about. I think about um, areas uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about um, in the future with our aging population and that needs to go to doctors that needs to get medical help and assistance. But there you know, we have this silver tsunami with all of these baby boomers who are going to be over 65 years old. How are we going to how how can technology and, and help us detect when they're vulnerable or even transportation issues around that, right? So there's all these types of things that I think we we need technology, but we need to be very smart with that technology. And we need, again, as I would say, we need lots of people, very smart, brilliant minds who understand technology much better than I do, that we can work collaboratively to figure out how this technology excuse me, can give us insights to um, what we need to know to, again, to help um, be protective factors or minimize um, risk factors for negative health. Hmm. I'm afraid to think that someone going in and looking at some of the texts I send when I'm tired, <laughs> or um, I mean, you can just, anyone can know I'm tired anytime I purchase something off of an Instagram ad. All right. That's, <laughs> but they think that's the point of those things. I think they know that's that. The, I'm tired. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, so yeah. it, it, really Dr. Al is what she's doing is she's saying, Hey, listen, um, you know, the Amazons of the world and all of these other marketing organizations, Google's, they use this because they understand the power of this technology to understand your behaviors yeah. for to make money. How can we use this, harness that power in science and um, technology and, and health to improve health? That's where we got a bunch of people starting to think about from that perspective. I love that. And Taylor, who asked that question, she's um, a, a big nerd. I hope she doesn't mind me saying that. Um, and a science person. So Taylor, you there's lots to there's lots to come in your life, maybe. Um, Reach out, Taylor. I'd love yeah. to work with you. Let me know how I can put you with people who look at these kinds of things. But yes, we need yeah. those kinds of minds. Yes. Um, and then Stacy kind of had a comment very similar to what I was going to say next, Stacey said, I'd love to know how people use their devices to connect with other patients, especially in the early days of diagnosis. So many things to think about. 
Um, and that's how technology, when I try to think about the internet, and it's kind of the scary parts as far as people getting information that could be inaccurate information, but I, those social connections that have been fostered around the world for people with, you know, I know for narcolepsy um, have been so powerfully good um, in ways that otherwise you would have felt pretty isolated and never really met people living with the same condition. Um, so yeah, I think that's some of the good side and some of the, yeah, I think like when people develop new apps for behavior change, I'm always wondering, are there social elements of that? Do those, do those apps um, let you to connect to other people? Cause I think that's sort of a, um, often people think of technology and they don't think about the social, the importance of social support with behavior yeah, change. Well, I think you raised some, something that's very important. And, and that's why I like working with, you know, Project Sleep. I work with the Alzheimer's Association is because um, integrity is so important in terms of information, developing information, the dissemination of information, right? You said there's so much misinformation, right? So to be in a space that you are, you know, I know that you you think about this a lot and I know that, you know, your website and your whole organization is a resource mm -hmm. for individuals as they connect, right? And so you, you talked about, again, storytelling. You have the portion of sleep apnea, people who are dealing with, you know, have different sleep issues how to be able to, to go through and be able to empower them to go tell their story. I know that at my conference, when sleep is, is, a, is an important part of what we do in, in advocacy. So we say, hey, listen, I don't have to be the sleep advocate, but I, I need to have a strong relationship with an organization like Project Sleep, who I know that when I direct people there, that they are the advocates for that space. So I, I think, you know, technology, and that's the only way that we can really do that is to remain very, vigilant in terms of our integrity and make sure that, you know, people know that the information that we give them uh, through organizations like yours and the Alzheimer's of the two groups that I work with, that there's integrity behind the information and all the people that are involved with that. Yeah, that's a good point. Great point. Um, I was going to ask a little bit more about the Black Men's Brain Health Conference and um, how you started getting involved in that. And yeah, I mean, this will be your third, you're going to going on your yeah. third. We're going into our third year. Absolutely. And it has, um, I don't, I mean, I don't know how this thing happened, but it has grown into this, you know, I think our challenge now. So let me just start by how did we get involved? Um, good dear friend of mine, but also a mentor and a colleague is Dr. Carl Hill, who um, is now the director of DEI for the Alzheimer's Association. But at one point, he was um, in charge of the Butler Williams Scholars Program at the, the National Institute of Aging, which is a program for early career scholars um, to, for them to be able to receive um, training and career development. And he was understood the work that I was doing and transitioning from being like a medical sociologist and uh, an ethnographer to a mixed methods multi-methods kind of researcher. And he said, you know, Robert, there, we have this grant mechanism at NIA, which is called the R, um, R13. It's a conference grant. And you can get it from anywhere from one to five years. He said, but you have this, you're sitting in this really unique space. You, you can bring some of the biggest brands uh, together, most recognizable brands. He said, one, you're, you're a member of the NFL Alumni Association. So you have direct you know, access to lots of athletes. And we know that people turn to athletes like in college, a athletic sports is the front porch, right? So you, can, you have the shield of the NFL Alumni Association that you can work directly with. He goes, you know, you can get grant funding from the National Institute of Health through the National Institute of Aging. You bring those two together and then you can bring together the Alzheimer's Association. He goes, listen, very few people can sit in the intersection of those spaces, right, and have the training and have the access to bring something together, which we know that Black men are at the greatest risk, right, and, but they also are the most underrepresented in participation in science, right, so biomedical science. And so with that, you know, Know, influence, I reached out to Dr. Monica Rivera Mint, who's a neuropsychologist at uh, Fordham University and at Mount Sinai. And uh, she happens to be an Afro Latino um, descent. And I said, Hey, would you be willing to help me with this, uh, you know, 
participate with this conference that I want to put together. And she said, absolutely. But you've got to include Dr. Desiree Bird. She's my sidekick. We do everything together. If you're if there's space for her, we'd love to be able to do that. So we have Carl Hill, myself. We had a um, brother named Ron Rice, who's played for the Detroit Lions. Just I pulled it on my networks and we said, hey, we did this a few times just kind of on our own doing a, a um, town hall meeting during the Super Bowl in Atlanta and was tremendously successful. And so we got the money. We All of these things have all kind of come together. And so what we do with the conference is we do it during Super Bowl week every year. Uh, last year, the first year it was at um, USC on campus there of which you were a part of. And we always have an academic partner and we work with lots of community organizations. This year, past year, it was at the Arizona State University at the Tempe campus. Next year, we'll be at UNLV where we have a great support from the president there who is my personal mentor, um, Dr. Keith Whitfield. So lots of things have come together where this year uh, between in-person as well as um, online, virtual, we had almost a thousand people involved with our conference over the two days. So there's obviously a great need and we're, you know, we struck a chord and there's lots of people who are actively engaged in it. Yeah, I thought it was, um, I attended the one in Los Angeles, as you said, and I, I thought there were some um, amazing speakers and uh, really good life lessons, <laughs> um, you know, uh, just uh, Gosh, I won't be able to say it off the top of my head, but just uh, some really good conversations around, um, yeah, I guess putting your health first a little bit more so, um, even at while people are active uh, as professional athletes. Um, and yeah, you just, you put together an amazing group of people. So um, that's pretty, pretty special. Probably a lot of work too. It's a lot of work, but yeah. let me say this also, um, we use sports as our, um, as our front porch, right? But we are really trying to um, trying to reach the whole community. So our, our who we work with is we work with again clinicians. We work with community based organizations. We work with um, researchers, scientists, and we work with a lot of the athletic community um, to be involved with this because we want we we are really trying to help people understand what are the risk and resilience factors around brain health. And I also will say that the reason that we um, we focus on brain health is because we had a conversation with. Um, with Beasley Reese, who happened to be at the time, he was the president of the NFL Alumni Association. And he said to me, he said, you know, Doc, he said, as football players in particular, all we hear is bad news about, you know, mental health, you know, concussion is going to break, you know, you break your head wide open and you're going to have all kinds of problems later in life. He goes, is there any good news that you can focus on? And, and that, that helped me understand that, you know what, we want to talk about again, brain health. We want to talk about the risk and the resilience factors. Are there things that people are doing to help really preserve and protect their health, right? Not just football players, but all. What can we learn from one another? What can we learn by having a dialogue instead of just having scientists all spout out their work that mm -hmm. which nobody really can engage with is, is for us in the ivory tower? How can we get out of that how can we bust out of that, not have a hierarchy, but really hear from and work together in a community setting so we can find out answers and understand the more important questions that need to be asked? Mm. Well, I think that sounds amazing. Um, Taylor had one other question for you, which um, I think is sort of a good, you know, possibly wrap things up question, which is what um, research are you, you know, would you like to do in the future? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, let me say this, because I really would love people to be engaged. One, let me give people the website address mm -hmm. uh, for the, the conference. It's mensbrainhealth.org, right? And, and you'll understand we do the Black Men's Brain Conference, but we really designate this as um, the Men's Brain Health Initiative. So we're starting with Black men, but we're looking and will open up by working with other people to look at other communities, right? Um, and, and when I say communities, not just men, we hope that we'll, you know, we have some women out there. We have people from, you know, LGBTQ, 
people say, hey, we, we want to take what, what you've learned and how can you help us open something up like this for our communities, right? So that's where really we're hoping to get lots of different people involved. And we know that sleep is really important through that. So again, mensbrainhealth.org. And if you want to learn more about the different projects that I have, um, go to rwturnerlab.com. Dot com and you can see all of the different projects that we have there but you know one of the things that I have a real passion about is that I'm hoping and am working on it's a slow burn but I'm working on trying to get athletes former athletes across the life course right I mean from all different ages and do a national longitudinal study to understand how being involved with playing sports on every different level how that impacts your impacts your health all aspects of your health uh, across your life course. So what does it mean to start for some people to start sports? Like for me, I pursued my, my athletic career starting at about nine years old. And I played till 16, till for 16 years, uh, I played uh, some form of all different types of sports. What does that mean for my health? Not just my brain health, my overall health over a long period of time. What does that mean for a gymnast who starts at five years old and then stops at 18 years old? But but that a large part of it is that's their identity and their health and their body and their injuries are all impacted by those early experiences. I want mm -hmm. to put together kind of a, a longitudinal study that looks at multiple aspects of your health so that way we can understand again the risk and the resilience factors involved with that one of the things that i hear all the time when i'm around perform professional football players the athletes say this the doctors who treat them everyone says that you have such a unique profile that you're different than so many other people other men in society which we know that's true so therefore there comes a lot of issues around their health but can't we say that same thing about people who have played sports for a long period of time, um, what has that done to their bodies? But we forget about them over time. How does that really impact how they see themselves? And what are their unique issues that they're dealing with? So I'm really, um, I hope that if I don't get that done, that I'm working with lots of young scholars who will take the mantle of that, really care about them, see that as a community. Uh, and then we can start to approach it that way. And we can find out what do we need to do both to encourage people, but also protect people when they go through sports as a lifelong endeavor. Wow. That sounds like really good work. It kind of reminds me that wasn't there like a Harvard study? They studied a bunch of men at Harvard through like 80 years or something. They checked in with them. Um, sure. So big project. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm one of those people who says, okay, what isn't there? What needs to be there? How do we get it done? Instead of saying that's too much, that's too big, let's not do it. Somebody's got to do it because again, we know millions of people for whatever reason play sports, but then they don't play sports, right? And again, sports is different than being physically active, better than athletic. You know, we want to understand again, where are, meet people wherever they are, no matter what you're doing, let's meet them where they are, let's get them involved. So that way, you know, again, my, where I'm coming from is how do we address health inequality? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone's just saying very enjoyable conversation, such important work. Uh, Rachel, thank you for putting in the links that um, Dr. Okay. Turner mentioned. So we have those links there for people um, and just a lot of appreciation. So um, yeah, thank you so much for, for kicking. Uh, well, not you didn't kick off. This is the grand finale. We uh, <laughs> grand finale of the sleep in and thank you everyone for participating in the sleep in this weekend. I was kept trying to make sure everyone realized I was on brand here yeah. um, in my shirt. And uh, it's just, it's been a great weekend. Um, we've had, you know, everything from stretching to advocacy uh, and uh, talking about insomnia um, and just uh, everyone's thank you for your posts on social media and your fundraising efforts for Project Sleep. So we have so much more to do. <laughs> I think that's, uh, so we'll try to get a good night's sleep tonight and then we'll, we'll be back at it <laughs> tomorrow. But well, thank you so very much for having me here. This was wonderful. I hoped in some way that I, I said something that can encourage people. And um, hey, listen, I hope that I can also have opportunities to work with different populations that are involved with Project Sleep. So um, let's keep it going. All right. Well, have a good night's sleep. Thank I you, Dr. Do Turner. That. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.